Insurance fraud in the UK costs more than £1.2 billion a year. That's more than £3 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing a fraudulent claim every five minutes. Armed with the latest fraud-busting technology, including covert surveillance systems, sophisticated data analysis techniques and specially trained fraud investigators. They're catching these chances red-handed. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Today on Claimed and Shamed, a career criminal who masterminded an insurance racket worth a quarter of a million pounds is sent back behind bars after investigators expose his wrongdoing. This is a huge scale fraud. This was the second largest scam that Aviva had dealt with. Fraud to that list will not go away with it in the end. A woman claiming tens of thousands of pounds for an injury caused by a faulty shoe is tripped up by her own evidence and the investigators who stay hot on her heels. This is a particularly opportunistic type of fraud. She obviously saw that there was a potential fault with the shoes and saw an opportunity to make a claim against our high street retailer, but ultimately she was found out. The couple who put in a phony injury claim for £30,000 sees the wheels come off the case when the story doesn't add up. When the injury is presented to us, uh, especially the impact on their daily activities and their daily lives, you'd expect the collision to have been quite severe. It was no more than a very minor impact. Every year, thousands of unscrupulous individuals hoping to cash in on a quick buck will try their hand at insurance fraud. Today on Claimed and Shamed, we have a group of people which didn't bet on the lengths that insurance investigators will go to catch them out. With ever more sophisticated methods to expose these fraudsters, they're being caught red-handed. In this first case, the City of London Police's Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department worked alongside a team of insurance investigators to stop a criminal and his associates in their tracks. Some crooks just can't help themselves. The serial scammer in our next case had already spent time behind bars for insurance fraud, but this didn't stop him from having another go. It all started off with what appeared to be a straightforward claim. We received a claim for a Mercedes-Benz. The claim was for repairs after the vehicle had been involved in an accident, which had been hit in the rear, and we'd received repair costs for £2,285. Jody didn't have any concerns about this claim initially, so it was paid out and put to bed. But less than a year later, the police were in touch, warning that this claimant was in fact a fraudster who was targeting Aviva. The team immediately took another look at the file and discovered this wasn't the first time this fraudster had tried it on. They'd already investigated him many years earlier when he was using a different name. We had originally identified Hamid Siddiqui 10 years prior under a separate alias called Kevin Heartbreak. This individual had targeted Aviva 10 years before and had been involved in an investigation of which he had staged multiple accidents. Back then, this fraudster had been caught operating under multiple names and had been exposed for making bogus motor claims for tens of thousands of pounds against Aviva. As a result of that, Siddiqui was sentenced to 18 months in prison and following his release was back up to his old tricks again. Having been tipped off by IFED that this criminal could be at it again, Jodie and her team completed a comprehensive review of any claims that could be linked to him, past or present. We were looking for any evidence that Siddiqui could be involved in a new fraud ring. This is when the insurers discovered that the claim for the Mercedes-Benz wasn't all it seemed. On the invoice for the repairs to the car, there was a personalised number plate and phone number that were both linked to Siddiqui. And it wasn't just the Merc. 
the fraud team also uncovered a string of fake policies and claims he'd been involved in. Our investigators identified over 60 policies and 40 claims which were all attributed to Siddiqui over a two-year period. It soon transpired that Siddiqui wasn't working alone. His girlfriend at the time and another co-conspirator were in on it too. When the insurers uncovered the depth of their operation, they were stunned. The trio were operating by setting up fraudulent bank accounts using stolen IDs. This information would then be used to intercept fraudulent motor insurance policies. Once these policies were set up, one of the individuals would then pose as one of the policy holders and would call to report a motor collision. One of the other individuals would then call us and pretend to be the third party involved in this said motor collision. Occasionally, Siddiqui would pose as both the policy holder and the third party and give information regarding the accident. As part of her investigation, Jodie requested the passport used to open one of the bank accounts where the claims money had been deposited. She found this passport had been created under a different name, but the photograph in it was of Siddiqui. It's a very serious matter to fraudulently create a passport. I think this goes to show the lengths that Siddiqui was planning to go to to continue to accept these policies and bank accounts using fraudulent information. The investigators also found that the trio had submitted fake evidence to back up their claims. They had used online photos of damaged cars and sent those in. That's incredibly bold of the individuals to have taken the accident images from the internet. And again, it goes to show the lengths they'd go to to try and prove these accidents did happen when we know that they didn't. Whilst Jodie had been looking into the trio's activities, Officers at the Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department had also been carrying out their own investigation. They discovered that Siddiqui had changed his MO and had branched out beyond claiming just for faked motor collisions. He was pretending to be a bona fide company dealing with claims on behalf of customers. IFED discovered that Siddiqui had cloned a genuine claims management company. So Siddiqui had manufactured claims himself, created an incident that did not happen, cloned a claims management company, and then referred this over to a solicitor, at which point the solicitor would have thought they were acting on behalf of a genuine customer, when in fact these policies and these customers didn't exist. He was basically creating fake claims in order to benefit from a referral fee for solicitors to then act on those individuals' behalf. Siddiqui was busted when the genuine claims management company contacted the solicitors themselves to refer some claims on, only to discover that they supposedly already had a working relationship with them. Realising their company had been cloned, their director alerted the Ministry of Justice, which put an end to Siddiqui's very lucrative con. In total, Siddiqui made £245,000 from the claims management company being cloned and from the insurance scam. Evidence showed that Siddiqui and his partner had been splashing the cash and they hadn't even tried to hide it. Siddiqui had even posted photos of his dog online, covered in piles of dosh. They would spend their money on an extravagant lifestyle, such as expensive holidays, designer clothes and very expensive cars. The cash sums this trio had scammed, plus the amount of fraudulent claims they'd made, added up to a sizeable case. This was a huge scale fraud. This was the second largest scam that Aviva had dealt with. In total, we provided 19 statements to the police, which totaled 278 criminal exhibits. With their fraud ring now blown wide open, Siddiqui and his two associates were all charged and appeared at the Inner London Crown Court. Hamid Siddiqui pleaded guilty to one count of fraud by false representation, one count of conspiring to commit fraud by false representation, and three counts of possessing or controlling identity documents with intent. He was sentenced to a four-year custodial sentence.
As for his co-conspirators, his then-partner, Belma Draganovic, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiring to commit fraud by false representation. She was sentenced to an 11-month custodial sentence, suspended for 18 months. Siddiqui's second co-conspirator pleaded guilty to one count of conspiring to commit fraud by false representation and was sentenced to a three-month tagged curfew order. All three ended up with a criminal record, and Siddiqui, who'd committed insurance fraud before, found himself heading back to the slammer. Fraud to that list will not go away with it in the end. We're working hard internally to identify fraud, but also working with agencies to share information where appropriate and ultimately prosecute where we have evidence. Later, the wedding photographer who blamed the bride for ruining his camera equipment does a runner after investigators blow his story out of the water. Like a lot of these cases, the forces try it on, have been caught, and they go to grounds hoping that they will never hear anything of it again. If you want the benefit of insurance protection when you're on holiday or out in the car, for example, you would expect to have to pay for the cover out of your own pocket, but you can get a payout with other kinds of insurance that you don't have to pay a penny for. If you're out and about in places like restaurants and shops, they have to take out their own cover, which means you can claim from them if you think they've sold you a product that's resulted in illness or injury. But if you make up a dodgy claim against them, watch out. They will investigate. We insure a uh, high street retailer that sells shoes. This insurance is called product liability, so this essentially covers them if any of their products cause any injury to any customers that may purchase them. Howard John works for Zurich, which received a claim about a faulty shoe. The claimant in this instance had purchased a pair of shoes from our insured. Ten days later, when wearing them, she suffered a fall and, as a result, injured her foot. The woman said her new shoes were to blame for the incident. After falling, she removed her shoe and noticed that uh, it had some loose stitching, uh, so which she believed to be the reason as to why she had the accident. The fall had left the woman badly hurt. According to the claimant, she'd suffered an orthopaedic injury to her foot and also an injury to her back, and also it exacerbated a pre-existing chronic pain condition that she had. The incident had severely affected her day-to-day -day life and affected her mobility, and she was unable to do normal everyday tasks. Before assessing the value of the claim, Howard and his team got in touch with the retailer to find out whether the shoe had been faulty and possibly responsible for the woman's accident. The company admitted there was a problem. Our insured had inspected the shoes and noted that they appeared to be a fault. At this stage, there was no real concerns with the claim. It seemed relatively straightforward, so liability was accepted. Zurich agreed to pay out on the woman's personal injury claim. The next step was to come up with an appropriate settlement. The case was passed to lawyers to establish the value of the claim that we would need to settle. They advised that they believed uh, the injuries sustained were valued at around £30,000. This figure was put to the woman, but she turned it down. It's likely that she felt that she was entitled to more or that she could potentially get more from us. With the offer rejected, the case looked like it was destined for court. The insurer passed matters to its legal team, which began to gather further evidence. A request was put in for the woman's medical records and for photographs of her injured foot. When we reviewed the pictures, we actually looked at the metadata that was attached to them. This is information that provides us with the day, date and time in which the pictures were taken. The examination of the metadata was revealing. The photos of the woman's injured foot had been taken four months before the accident caused by the faulty shoe. For Howard and his team, this set alarm bells ringing. We had concerns then that this incident hadn't occurred in the way that the uh, claimant described. The investigators cross-referenced the date the photographs had been taken with the woman's medical records and got lucky. So we actually discovered that there was an entry 
on the date in which those pictures were taken. And it had nothing to do with a faulty shoe. The claimant had suffered an injury to her foot when she got it caught under some furniture, which obviously contradicted what she was claiming with us, advising that the injuries were sustained from faulty shoes. This evidence was damning. Howard was now convinced that the claimant wasn't telling the truth. Ultimately, we feel that what really happened is that the claimant had injured her foot when she got it stuck under some furniture several months prior to the date of the alleged accident with ourselves. We don't feel that the injury was in any way related to the faulty shoes and that the incident was completely fabricated. At this point, the insurer decided not to reveal to the claimant that it was known she'd been in A&E with a completely different injury on the day the photos were taken. That would be shared with her if the case ended up in court. In the meantime, the £30,000 settlement offer was withdrawn and the woman was challenged about the fact that the dates on her photos didn't match up to the date of her supposed fall. The claimant initially advised that the settings on her iPad, which she took the photographs with, were incorrect. She advised that a friend could vouch for that, uh, and she continued to maintain that the photographs were taken uh, two weeks after the day of the accident. The insurer asked the woman to sign a statement of truth that could be used in court, confirming that what she'd said about her tablet settings was true. She couldn't provide any sort of explanation as to why the dates were so different. She advised that she was relatively inexperienced with technology, and as a result, she may have changed the settings, which is why they came up as they did. The woman was sticking to her story. Howard couldn't disprove it, as he wasn't able to inspect her tablet because she'd got rid of it. He widened the investigation and was surprised to discover the claimant hadn't reported the accident to her own GP. And there was evidence to suggest that she hadn't even mentioned it to any of her own friends or family. It was clear that if she had suffered a genuine injury, this would have been brought up. And when her social media was examined, there were further inconsistencies. We located evidence to suggest that she had been going on holiday and conducting exercise, which kind of contradicted her suggestion that she was actually immobile and unable to partake in those activities. With a mountain of circumstantial evidence piling up against the women, the insurer sought specialist help to determine whether her claims about her tablet settings could be true. We discussed with our experts in terms of whether or not it was possible for the dates of the uh, metadata of the photographs to be altered, uh, and they came back to confirm that this wasn't the case, especially by someone who was as a self-confessed, inexperienced person when it came to technology. Confident the woman wasn't telling the truth about when the photos had been taken, the investigators turned their attention to her injuries. They asked their own medical expert to examine her. They concluded that the problems she was experiencing with her health were all linked to her pre-existing conditions and couldn't be related to a one-off accident. The insurers shared these findings with the woman's own specialists, who promptly changed their position. Essentially, the claimant's medical experts had reduced the severity of their report, which meant it sort of was more in line with our report. This case was so complicated that it had taken five years to get it ready for trial. But at the 11th hour, before it came to court, the woman performed a dramatic U-turn. It was clear to us at this point, and given the wealth of information and evidence that we had, the claimant just felt that the game was up and she cut her losses and decided that she would withdraw the claim. Instead of the £30,000 settlement she could have walked away with, the woman offered to pay a monthly contribution towards Zurich's costs, which were valued at around £34,000. This is a particularly opportunistic type of fraud. She obviously saw that there was a potential fault with the shoes and saw an opportunity to make a claim against our high street retailer, but ultimately she was found out. It's clear in this instance that the claimant underestimated our investigator's ability to stay hot on the heels of her deceit. Here in the UK, the most popular form of public transport is the bus, with nearly 40,000 of them on our roads. 
At more than 10 metres long and weighing in at several tonnes, they need a steady hand behind the wheel. Drivers are put through weeks of specialist training, but despite this, the odd prang is occasionally inevitable when guiding these giants of the road around our narrow streets. But there are those who will take a collision as an opportunity to claim, forgetting that the fraud team will have access to the bus's CCTV. First Bus is one of the largest bus operators in the UK. Claims made against its vehicles are dealt with in-house, with investigators checking whether they're genuine or made by chances trying their luck. Julie Randall is a fraud prevention officer whose job it is to sort the wheat from the chaff. One of our buses was turning into a junction when unfortunately it clipped the offside rear of a vehicle that was waiting to pull out. The accident had happened in Scotland. It was a minor scrape in the grand scheme of things. The bus had only caused a small amount of damage to the car when it brushed past. The occupants of the car, a husband and wife in their 50s, got in touch with the bus company. We received a claim for the damage to the vehicle, which we repaired ourselves. But it wasn't just the car being claimed for. They'd also both been injured during the accident. The two claimants both claimed that the impact was so severe that the vehicle was jolted and they were thrown sideways. Because of this, the husband and wife experienced whiplash, which affected their necks and backs. As a result of the injury sustained in the incident, they claimed that they had a massive impact on their lives. Um, they couldn't do their shopping properly, their housework, bending over, walking up the stairs, shaving, and that's just a few. The list went on and on and on. Due to the severity of their injuries, the total value of the couple's claim was around £30,000. But for Julie, it just wasn't adding up. We had concerns as soon as we received both injury claims. The impact was so minor, we couldn't see how any injuries could possibly have occurred from such a minor incident. To back up the personal injury claims, the couple sent in medical reports. These caused Julie further concern. The injuries didn't seem to be getting better, they just seemed to be getting worse, uh, and the impact on their lives was quite significant. When the injuries presented to us, uh, especially the impact on their daily activities and their daily lives, you'd expect the collision to have been quite severe. It was no more than a very minor impact, no more than the bus crushing against uh, the third-party vehicle. With alarm bells ringing, Julie and her team began investigating the claims. After any accident, the team turns to the CCTV cameras fitted to all their buses. They're the most reliable of witnesses, capturing everything as it happens. Initially, CCTV is used to verify liability, but we'll also use it to verify occupancy, um, whether an injury could be genuine, um, and any odd behaviour, and just what's going on at the scene of the accident. Julie was keen to see what the CCTV footage would reveal about this case. Looking at CCTV, you can see the bus turning into a junction. Unfortunately, it doesn't make his turn and he clips the back of a car. The bus stops, they swap details. The bus driver gets back on the bus and they drive off. So far, so good. It validated both drivers' version of the events. The bus came around the corner, clipped the vehicle. And it showed that the impact was extremely minor. But then, things took an unexpected turn. What we were not expecting the CCTV to reveal is that the male that got out of the car was significantly younger than the claim presented to us. Remember, the man who had put in the personal injury claim was supposed to be in his 50s. The gentleman that had got out of the vehicle was in his early 30s. That was a massive red flag. This was clearly a different, much younger man so the older man wasn't even in the car at the time of the collision. He just pretended to be in the car with his wife. We were not happy with the claim. We did not think that any injuries could possibly have occurred, and now we had a phantom passenger. We had no intention of paying out on this claim. Phantom passengers are individuals who pretend they were in a car when it crashed, so they can claim on the insurance. As they didn't realise the strength of the CCTV evidence, when their injury claims were rejected, the husband and wife issued court proceedings against First Bus 
We, of course, were more than happy to take this on. We instructed our lawyers who particularly enjoy defending claims of this nature, and they set about building our case. In a bid to gather further evidence before the case went to trial, Julie and her team arranged for the male passenger to attend an independent medical examination. First bus sent the CCTV footage to the medical expert before the examination took place so he'd know what the real passenger looked like. When the male phantom passenger walked into the medical expert's office, it was clear to the medical expert straight away that this was not the same individual he'd seen in the CCTV footage. Instead of the younger man who'd been filmed on the CCTV, an older man in his 50s turned up. The medical expert challenged the claimant and he admitted that he'd made a fraudulent claim. When the case finally got to court, the civil judge rejected their claims and ordered them to pay costs. He also said the case should be referred to Scotland's procurator fiscal. The couple was charged and the case went to trial at Scotland's Crown Court, where they both pleaded guilty to attempted fraud. They were fined £550 each and ordered to pay all legal costs, totalling £7,500. Rather than getting a £30,000 payout, the couple had to cough up nearly £9,000. As a result of their dishonest actions, they've now been left with a criminal record from committing a criminal offence. For Julie and her team, this case was a real win. First bus have a zero tolerance approach to Ford. Um, we repudiated the injury claims and they had the audacity to take us on with a phantom passenger. We were never going to leave it there. Still to come, a traveller who has a puncture on the way to the airport misses his flight, but his claim falls flat when he submits a forged receipt for his new tyres from a garage. Most concerning for us was they were actually closed at the time the invoice was issued, and also the person named on the invoice wasn't working that day. Every year, around 200,000 couples tie the knot here in the UK. But cars, suits, dresses, flowers and fizz don't come cheap, with the average wedding costing around £32,000. If you're planning on saying, I do, you may want to consider taking out wedding insurance, just in case things go wrong. But when it comes to the big day, it isn't just the bride and groom who take out cover. In fact, anyone associated with pulling off a couple's wedding, from venues to bridal shops and caterers to florists, should consider taking out insurance. And that includes wedding photographers, like in our next case. He was a professional videographer, photographer, specialising in weddings. The wedding photographer had taken out insurance with AXA on the 19th of August. Then, around two months later, on the 20th of October, he reported that an incident had happened at a wedding the previous day. He'd taken a picture and the bride came over to have a look at it. And as she came over, she knocked his camera into the lake um, and damaged the camera and equipment uh, beyond repair. A high-spec camera, lens and a couple of SD cards had all ended up underwater. Added up together, this photographic equipment was worth a significant amount of money. In total, he was claiming around three and a half grand. But the wedding photographer didn't appear to have done his sums. The policy had a limit on it of two and a half thousand pounds. As he was underinsured, the photographer wouldn't get back the full value of his equipment if he got any payout at all as Tom and his team had doubts about his case. From the outset of this claim, there were immediate concerns. The proximity of the, the claim to when the policy was taken out was only a couple of months. When we asked for proof of items, proof of purchase, etc., the customer wasn't very forthcoming with images to show those items. And when we asked about the circumstances, he was very vague. There, there were just some anomalies that just didn't feel right. Tom and his team also discovered that the photographer didn't have insurance with anyone else before he set up his policy. This was another red flag, as it was possible he'd taken out the policy with the sole intention of claiming. With concerns mounting, the insurers wanted to check out the story. We undertook a number of inquiries to verify the details that we were being given. So was this customer a professional videographer, photographer? 
did he shoot a wedding on this particular day at this particular location? Um, so they were all questions that we asked ourselves. Tom and his team scoured social media looking for any images or videos of the wedding the claimant had photographed on the 19th of October, but came away empty-handed. So they contacted the venue where the wedding took place, giving them details of the bride and groom and the date of the incident. And the response wasn't what the investigators had been expecting. They confirmed that there was no wedding on that day at all, and certainly not for this bride and groom. This wasn't adding up, and the venue had a further revelation. They did confirm that there was a wedding for this particular couple, um, but it, it was in at the very beginning of August 2021. That's two and a half months before the bride was supposed to have damaged the camera. Just in case the venue had got its dates wrong, they checked the internet again. And this time, with the correct date, they found the wedding and footage of the happy day shot by the photographer. And we found through a number of social media platforms uh, videos of the wedding, which again confirmed that it took place on the 1st of August 2021. And the key thing here being that that was 18 days prior to inception or, or the taking out of the policy by our customer. For Tom and his team, this new evidence marked the end of the road for any settlement the photographer might have been hoping for. This particular piece of information was damaging for this claim. Any damage caused to his equipment at this wedding was prior to the policy being taken with us and therefore wouldn't have been covered. By this point in the investigation, the insurer still hadn't been able to inspect the photography equipment to determine if it was damaged. Now, in light of the damning evidence uncovered, it wasn't thought necessary. We didn't need to exhaust many other avenues because we already had what we needed to reject the claim and bring it to a halt early on, rather than letting it go on and, and drag on. Damage, if it did occur to this equipment, occurred pre-inception, you know, prior to the policy being taken out with us, at a time when he had no cover anywhere else, and he fabricated the dates to try and ensure that he got payment for the damage to his items. Having concluded the investigation, the insurer wrote to the wedding photographer, laying out all the evidence that had been uncovered, and informed him the claim was going to be rejected and no payout would be made, citing fraud as the reason. Unsurprisingly, we, we didn't get a response to that. Like a lot of these cases, I think, you know, the forces try it on, have been caught, and they go to grounds hoping that they will never hear anything of it again. It didn't end there for the wedding photographer. AXA added him to the insurance fraud register. That carries consequences. It makes it incredibly difficult to obtain insurance products. And if you can obtain insurance products, it tends to be at a premium. So it tends to hit the forces financially. And that wasn't the only outcome. The insurers forwarded this case to the police. The matter was also referred to the insurance fraud enforcement department. They've investigated and they have given the customer a police caution. It was a high price to pay for this dishonest photographer and Tom has a word of warning for any other would-be scammers. Frauds like this are quite basic. Often someone's just taken a chance and they're not insured for a particular item that they own. It then ends up damaged for whatever reason or by whatever means. They realise that they're going to be out of pocket, so they retrospectively try to purchase cover, fabricate and lie about the dates, try and force cover. The message I would have is don't take that chance. If you've got an item that's of value to you, insure it. Um, and then if something does happen, you can legitimately claim for it. Whether you're trekking through the Andes or popping over to the Costa del Sol for some winter sun, you may want to consider taking out travel insurance to cover you for things like medical expenses, lost luggage or cancelled flights. Many travellers who take out a policy end up needing it, with insurers paying out on nearly half a million travel claims a year. But travel insurance doesn't cover every eventuality, and when it fails to pay out, there are some people who think that they can scam the system. But these unscrupulous individuals had better tread carefully, as the insurers will scrutinise their claims and catch them out. 
Whilst most of us love going on holiday, air travel can be a stressful business, including things going wrong on the way to the airport that make you late for your flight. Insurance can help, but you'd better read the small print, as many policies won't cover missed flights if you've overslept or got stuck in a traffic jam on the way there. Many insurers will consider paying out, though, if it's car trouble that makes you late for takeoff. The claim was for a missed flight to Ghana. The claimant said that they were travelling for leisure purposes and on the way to the airport they had a flat tyre which they said was the reason for missing their flight. Investigations manager Adam Grady was tasked with assessing this traveller's claim. He works for Charles Taylor, which scrutinises claims for some of the UK's biggest insurers. The traveller had repaired the tyre himself by the side of the road, but then he'd encountered further problems when rejoining the traffic, there was then slow moving traffic. They also told us that there was an issue with the shuttle bus when they arrived at the airport and that the airline staff at check-in weren't very helpful. These reasons unfortunately wouldn't be covered by the policy. So the concern was that the tyre had been introduced into the claim to get cover. As he'd missed his original outbound flight, the traveller had to buy a new return ticket to Ghana, so was asking for a payout of £1,750. No pocket change. So Charles Taylor asked the man to submit evidence to back up his claim. In this instance, it would be something to prove that they had the, the flat tyre. Although it's reasonable they may fix it themselves, we would need something to show that an insured event has occurred, such as a, a new tyre invoice or the sealant kit that was used to repair the tyre. As he'd fixed the puncture himself, the claimant said there wasn't any documentation to prove what had happened. A claimant's testimony alone isn't enough to support a claim happening. It is possible that someone could lie about the reason for missing their flight, so although they have genuinely missed it, it may be for a reason not covered by a policy. Unfortunately, on this occasion, as the claimant wasn't able to provide any evidence of an insured incident occurring, the decision was made to decline the claim. After he'd found out that he wasn't entitled to a payout, the traveller got back in touch with Charles Taylor with more information, saying that he'd suffered another flat tyre on the way home from the airport. Once again, he'd fixed this second puncture himself with a sealant kit, but then had stopped at a garage to replace both flat tyres. Only now did the traveller submit an invoice for the two new tyres. This was a red flag to us as the claimant hadn't initially mentioned not only the second issue on the way home, but also that they were in possession of this invoice when they registered the claim. It also seemed unusual to Adam that the traveller would have been unlucky enough to have sustained two punctures on what had been a short journey. With suspicions raised, the invoice was inspected and concerns only grew when the metadata was examined. So metadata is information inside the document that can tell us about when it was created, whether it's been modified. The invoice's metadata didn't add up. We could see it was initially issued in May 2021, but had actually been modified on the 8th of November 21, which was one day before the claimant had submitted it to us. Although there could be a reason for the metadata changing shortly before it was sent to us, it could also indicate that the claimant has changed information within that document to try and gain cover. With the concerns about the traveller's claim mounting, it was now time for the investigation to ramp up. It was decided the best course of action would be to conduct a telephone interview with the claimant first, while making inquiries with the garage in the background. During the call, the claimant stuck firmly to his flat tyre story. In terms of red flags from the interview, nothing was raised that would cause suspicion. Meanwhile, the garage where the traveller had bought his two new tyres had responded to Charles Taylor's request for information. What was said ended up casting serious doubt on his version of events. There were a number of points on the invoice that meant they were categorically able to confirm it hadn't come from them. They said that they hadn't sold any tyres in the time frame that was on the invoice the type of tyre that was fitted to the vehicle wouldn't have been the one they would have used. Most concerning for us was they were actually closed at the time the invoice was issued and also the person named on the invoice wasn't working that day. The garage's testimony proved without doubt that the invoice was a fake. 
Once we had evidence that the document was false, the matter was escalated to myself, I decided it was necessary to speak with the claimant in more detail to put these issues to them and see what their explanation was. Adam called the traveller himself to tell him what had been discovered about the invoice. You spoke with my colleague last, I believe it was last Friday, just regarding your, your claim. Um, and since then we've been uh, finalising our validation inquiries. But just before we proceed with the call, I just need to advise you that we record all calls and that's for quality control, training purposes and for the monitoring of fraudulent claims. Are you okay, okay. to proceed on that basis? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, as part of the validation inquiries, we made uh, contact with who issued the invoice or whose details are on the invoice that you've submitted to us. Um, before I go over what they've told us, is there anything you want to tell me about that invoice? Uh, no. Okay, because having spoken to them, they've actually said that invoice wasn't issued by them. Okay. Well, I got that. Yeah. Okay, is there any reason that you're aware of that they would tell us that that invoice hasn't been issued by them? No, I don't, I don't have any reason. I, I don't know. I wouldn't know. Okay. Now, just in relation to that invoice, it currently looks like it's a, a false invoice that's been submitted in support of the claim, uh, which is something that we would take very seriously. I will okay. give you the opportunity to be open and honest with me. Have you created that invoice for this claim? No, I haven't. The claimant didn't react in a way I would expect from someone who's been told that a document they've submitted is false. They didn't argue, they didn't seem shocked, they just said, OK, I'll check with the garage. This only added to our concerns that he knew about the document when submitting it. Adam wrapped up the call by telling the traveller that the insurer would write to him, laying out what the garage had said about the invoice and officially informing him that the claim would be rejected. That wasn't the end of the matter. The traveller then got back in touch. Strangely, following the interview, the claimant then emailed to say that we shouldn't use this as evidence to assess their claim because it was obtained after the fact they'd missed their flight and they didn't feel that this was relevant to their claim. We disagreed with this as this was the only piece of evidence that would support their claim if it was genuine. Based on all the evidence Adam and his team had gathered, including the phony invoice, the traveller's claim was declined in full and a fraud condition was invoked on his policy. Claimants often think that their documents may just slip through the net. In this situation, that clearly wasn't the case. Not only did the claimant forge a document in this case, they've also involved an innocent third party in their fraud. Another shocking case of deception and a timely reminder that we all need to remain vigilant to the scourge of insurance fraud. From chances exaggerating injury to criminal gangs engineering crashes for cash, these tricksters hit us all in the pocket. Every year, insurers lose millions to these scams, and it's you, the policyholder, who ends up paying the price in hikes to your premiums. But the sheer number of thieves caught in the act sends a clear message to anyone thinking about cheating the system. They claimed, but now they're shamed.